Hello listener, welcome to or welcome back to the Rugby Bricks podcast. My name is Peter Breen, your founder and host of the Rugby Bricks podcast. Today's guest is Jace Ryan. He has a huge passion for the front row and also the Ford pack. He's back for his fifth season with the Crusaders where he has been hugely successful. Jace is also part of the Fiji coaching team all the way through to 2023. Before we jump into the podcast, I did want to make mention of two things. The first one being a very successful launch of our our very own Rebounder training ball. Now, we teamed up with Gilbert to develop a rugby training ball that you can use against a brick wall. I'm so big on outwork and outlearn, and this training tool gives you the ability to do as many reps as possible, as many reps as you want to in a day, just by using a brick wall. The training program that we have alongside it is also a huge training tool with all the cues, coaching tips, the drills, the skills that I pass on to players, all that are using the rebounded ball. So there's no excuse. Here is a tool that can literally help you every day and what a price that we can put on that. We've also made a program with a 100 session challenge. And I promise you, if you get through 100 sessions with the rebounded ball, your passing game will be absolutely flying. Secondly, in 2022, we're solving a massive problem for our UK-based customers and fans of Rugby Bricks. We're using a 3PL, a third-party logistics company, to bring you Rugby Bricks products. And we know that uh, shipping costs from New Zealand all the way to the UK, plus sometimes that little customs charge that comes up, has been a little bit putting off for a lot of customers, but we're hoping to really solve this problem next year and make it so much easier, a lot more affordable with a more uh, with a domestic charge to get your kicking tees to you. A couple of the countries involved, United Kingdom, Ireland, Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, Slovakia, Romania, Portugal, Poland, Norway, Netherlands, Italy, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Iceland, Estonia, Lithuania, to name a few. Exciting times. I'm pumped for that. I know that it's really going to help us grow as a business and expand the brand, help people outwork and outlearn the competition. So please enjoy this powerful podcast with Jace Ryan. Three, two, one. Jace Ryan, thanks so much for jumping on the Rugby Bricks podcast. No worries, mate. Uh, thanks for having me. That's good. I um, I really do appreciate your time. I know that you're a busy man and, and getting excited. Um, preseason, I'm sure, is just around the corner. So what what have you currently been up to? I've uh, been obviously just um, our Super Rugby teams. They all get named this Monday. So uh, we've been going through all that, been tracking um, a few boys um, playing some pretty good Bunnings Cup, um, mm. keeping a keeping an eye on those boys, and then also there's you know pretty much another squad as such because we have our preseason team because obviously All Blacks don't come back um, until a little bit later, which is understandable with their player load requirements. So we've got to get our cover for the All Blacks in those positions. Um, been tracking, been watching a lot of international footy, been working. Um, with Fiji, obviously, but no, I'm not not over there with them um, due to the COVID and so forth. Um, couldn't get that MIQ spot, so didn't been a lot of work with um, Rory Best, who's in the Fords, which has been great. Okay. And yeah, just tracking a couple of teams and having a look, um, look at a few themes of what's happening in the games and, and any uh, sort of common pitches and interpretations and what we can add to the Crusaders and point of difference and little bits and um, little areas really which Razor always makes sure that we're trying to evolve and get better he's always uh, on top of us which is great this um, is exactly why I wanted to get you on because it, you make asking questions really easy so from afar how have you been able to give input with what you've been seeing via, via Zoom and also is there anything you've picked up from another franchise that you find really interesting at the moment with the, the Fiji side of it from the Zoom yeah yeah, so, I mean, obviously, Rory's over there and um, he's doing the forward. So what I said to him from the start is it's it's really important that he coaches through his personality, mm-hmm. first and foremost, because it's his forward pack, you know, for these three tests. So, and it's important that they hear his voice and he presents. And I've just been hope, uh, helping him out with looking at our training footage, um, but sort of getting him to present to me first what he sees. 
and just helping him out. Obviously, he's still in that um, transition, I guess, from player to coach. And coaches don't make tackles. So he's had to pull himself back in training, obviously. But look, he's really knowledgeable of the game of rugby, first and foremost. And, um, you know, I've been learning a lot from him as well. So, yeah, just going through footage and doing our preview with Wales. And I'd do mine, he'd do his. So it was genuine. And then we'd just sort of combine it and make sure that we could get a plan to the boys um, so they understood it. That's pretty much how it works. It's pretty unique and different, but it is what it is. Yeah, and you mentioned as well you've been watching a lot. Is there any teams in particular outside of sort of who Fiji are playing that you're keeping your eye on for your Crusaders' work? Yeah, I, I really like um, what France did against Australia, actually, um, in that um, series over there. I think they've got unbelievable um, versatility in the way they attack and, and the platforms that they attack for them, especially around their lineouts. They haven't got a one common format formation of their lineouts. They've got three um, jumping loose forwards, which is effectively five jumpers, um, which is pretty unique on its own, which means they can attack from everywhere. So they'll throw it in quick, uh, similar to the Chiefs. So they've got good variation. They don't let defensive lineouts set very well. So I've really enjoyed watching that. Um, that was obviously a, a few months ago, but um, really looked at them quite hard. So it'd be interesting to see, obviously, what goes on there with the All Blacks. But I know that there's some some good synergy that we can bring in from a Crusaders point of view. How, because you've been involved for five years now as an assistant coach in, in this role, like I can imagine there's that many ideas that you can have a crack at and, and come with in a preseason. Like, how much are you actually changing from year to year? with new ideas and new concepts, uh, let's just say around the line out. Yeah, so you, your basic structure is always there. And then that's, that's your foundations. It's just little wee micro details and skill sets that you can tweak. And I'm really big on really driving our skill sets. I mean, I, I never jumped in a line out, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but I can... I can present and show the boys when there's opportunities and little cues of when we can jump and where we can hit space. Um, and that's that's more what you look at. And especially in New Zealand, when you play the New Zealand teams, the line-out defence is pretty similar. So you, you don't have a lot of variation. You don't have to have a lot of a variation in your movements, but what we're seeing and with the way the European teams and I'm sure some of the other super teams are picking up on it is there is actually a couple of little wee um, slight adjustments and formations defensively in the line out. So I'm real big also on setting our hookers up to succeed so that they've got the less amount of time with the ball above their head and they don't have to think. Yeah. So we hit the line and, and we're, we're ready. We're ready to jump. Outstanding. Um, I want to really talk about two meaty things in this convo, one being scrummaging and then and touch on mauling as well with a yeah. little bit in between. So scrummaging is where I'm keen to start. And I just noticed you put a post up, a little uh, project iron back with Owen Franks. Can you explain yeah. a little bit, a little bit more about that project and what you guys are working on? Yeah, I can. So the iron back scrum, which is um, basically a um, little bit of a uh, satellite um, type branch of Front Row Club, which is my company, and Owen and I had an idea of we're really big on um, safety, and there's a little bit of a trend at the moment where um, not a lot of kids uh, want to play in the front row, and not a lot of mums want their kids to play in the front row, so we're just going to, we've thought outside the box with this bit of equipment that we're pretty excited about that we're going to launch in probably about three weeks, so awesome. um, it gives the boys an understanding that the safe technique is the, the the best technique. So as opposed to the coach going down to the park and nine times out of ten picks the biggest kid to play prop yeah. and then puts a then puts a hooker beside him, another prop, two guys behind two guys behind him, a flanker and an eight, and then says crouch binded set. And you got eight guys going in a row at school level or whatever it is, and really none of them know how to generate power or use their body. So this machine is going to set guys up to succeed and understand how to generate power as an individual, and that'll help them as they build through the stages. So it can be used from anything from 
you guys that when the scrums, when they just engage around that 14, 15 year old, right through to a hundred test all black. So it's a pretty unique machine. You've clearly got a love for scrummaging, the, all the details behind it, coaching, which I'm keen for you to touch on is a lot of people go through their playing career. They, they love it, but they can't coach anyone and they're not very good at explaining it. So when did you kind of realize that you were able to do that? And, and I suppose the second part is you mentioned there about sort of 15, 16 year olds with goal kicking, a lot of kickers want to jump straight to, I want to kick the ball as far as possible. What is the thing than scrummaging that people want to do straight away before doing, before walking? Yeah, great. So the first question, I was really fortunate and I still am to be mentored by Mike Cron. Crono, Crono's mentored me and I've watched him, listened to him, asked him questions. He's asked me questions, challenged me, and he's been a massive part of my career um, to where it's at now. And in the early days, you know, probably 10 years ago, coaching 12 years, you could see that a lot of what he was coaching was understanding how to use your body to the young guys. So that sort of works in um, with how I've become to love it and understand it. And I've also looked at different sports like he has, but not the same. I was really mindful that I didn't want to be a carbon copy of Chrono, yeah. uh, but there's some great stuff that I've used, but I wanted to have my own point of difference of how I coach it. Um, I guess the second part of that sort of question that you talk about around the goal kicking, I'm a strong believer that um, the best the best scrum coaches I think around the world have played in the front row. Like I would never go and try and teach Richie Moonga how to kick. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> and I, I mean, I couldn't even kick a fence, but I, I don't think he. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, and that's all due respect. I mean, it's like yourself, isn't it? You've got a point of difference, a skill that you love and you've done. So, um, and what do they want to get into straight away? Well, they want to push as hard as they can. And it's actually, well, hang on. If we can peg this back a little bit and you can understand that you can generate power, first and foremost, your power comes from the ground. It doesn't come from your feet or your legs comes from the ground. If you've got your feet on the ground, you're going to generate power. They're basically squatters and squat rack. Yep. So then you, once you get that and they understand and their next strength and their core, especially young guys, it's always developing. That's that's a real key part of it. And then you build them up. Yeah. But they just want to get in the old scrum, you know, eight on eight, prop versus prop. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, in what you're talking about is – the, the IP that you build up as and, and reps you get through as a player, all the sessions you've had coaching, like that's what's built your knowledge to then pass on to other players. So I think you're right. The best coaches are sometimes the people that have gone through it because of the sheer amount of reps and exposure they've had to the skill. Um, it puts them in a really good place to coach it. With, I want to ask about your rowing analogy, just with the, the, the full eight. Can you explain a little yep. bit more on that? Yeah, so scrummaging um, the eight, we, we all get our power from the ground. But the rowers, they get their power from the water. So they have to have their paddle in the water for the boat to go. And they all need to be working together at the same time. If one paddle's out, they're not going to have as much power. So it's the same thing if we're trying to push and we haven't got 16 feet on the ground. Two have missed the hit or the chase. Um, they're not going to be as effective as an eight. So there's a lot of lot of synergies there. I met with a few rowing coaches and we've done some rowing drills on the grass at training where you sit the boys all in a line in an eight and here you have your halfback as the cox that's um, sitting at the front and he's doing the call and they do it with their eyes shut and all that sort of thing which makes them understand that the more they work together, the more effective they're going to be. What are they doing sitting on the ground when they get the call? What's the movement? So you sit them all in the line all behind each other and you say right you've got the oar in your right hand you've got yeah. it in your left hand and when when the um when the halfback says and i want you to rock forward and then you all go together imagine you're rowing yeah. and they'll slowly get it they'll slowly get it, then they'll go good and then you tap maybe one person on the shoulder and you say right when you hear the end i want you to go two seconds afterwards and it just throws everything out yeah 
Good example. So little things, little things like that are probably, uh, yeah, you know, we usually bring it out pre season for the boys and the Crusaders, but first 15 rugby, when, you, when you're coaching that younger age, which I always love to do, is make sure that I'm coaching club, school at some stage. I'll try not to ever say no because it keeps your eyes sharp and you're always learning. You actually, probably in a way, you at times probably coach more. I've, so I've, yeah, I've heard Razor talk about that as well, why he loves coaching club rugby and some first 15 stuff. So you genuinely feel your eye stays sharp when you go and do those coaching sessions. 100%. Oh, you know, you might be like, oh, you're going to a club training, you know, 6.30 at night, it might be wet, it might be cold. But I always get something out of it and always love it because they're just so hungry for information and, and learning and, um, you know, often get in the car and go, God, I'm glad I did that. It's 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 the old story. It's, you know, if something's important, you'll make time. If it's not, you'll make an excuse. And I, you know, that's that's where I started. I, I cut my track coaching club rugby, learning, getting my hands dirty and coming through that way. And, you know, often hear, you know, coaches and, and, and you know, they say, oh, you know, you know what, what's the pathway? You know, what's the pathway? There's actually no pathway. I don't think there's ever been a pathway, but there is opportunities. <laughs> yeah, is. you're absolutely right. That, 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 that question gets asked a lot. You hear it, how do I get to the next step? What is the pathway? But what you're saying is get out there and do the reps. Do the reps, you know, coach like myself and, and Razor and, you know, Leon McDonald was here. All our coaching team that have been through the Crusaders the last five years, we've all coached club rugby, you know, Colts, senior rugby, it, um, you know, I coach the West Coast and the Heartland team. It's it's all part of it, and it sets you up to succeed. Yeah, I love that. Great message. Understanding individuals' bodies. Everyone's different, got different body shapes and flexibility and whatnot. What's some of the work you do to help the guys understand their body, their strengths, and, and maybe where they're vulnerable? Yeah, I think, um, I think wrestling is really good especially yep. for kids. Um, if we could do more wrestling in schools, you know, like that's where society's changed a little bit. You know, you used to come home and dad would come home from work and you'd wrestle with your son out in the backyard or, you know, <laughs> yep. get a bit of skin off or get in the lounge. I'm not sure that happens as much as it used to. Yeah. But that builds confidence. And when you've got confidence in your body and your head and your neck strength and all of that, so we do a lot of wrestling work at the Crusaders, 100% we do. It's vital because it's building confidence in your body, contact, and in your head. If you've got confidence in your head, you're going to make tackles. And that's where I believe there'd be a big, big point of difference for younger coaches and players and even New Zealand rugby to get wrestling into schools, get the boys wrestling. They love it. And it's reaction time, it's balance. It's all those sort of things which are important to not only scrummaging, but breakdown, neck strength. You know, it's set them up. I grew up with two uh, brothers, so we were WWE wrestlers for our whole upbringing <laughs> in, the, uh, in the bedrooms and wrestling, so I know exactly what you mean. So through the, I suppose, the upbringing of a, a school player at the moment, there's probably no fix of wrestling and getting exposed to that at the moment, is there? No. I reckon there's a real unique opportunity for contact coaches. If you were a specialist, if you could provide something around a specialist contact program, a wrestle and run format, um, you could take it anywhere. You know, like, you now we talk about biting down on our mouth guards and lock our jaw up and our chin and getting in tight seams when you're trying to hold players up and jackle them and getting under the ball. All of that stuff is so important, whereas we're ripper rugby straight into contact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and we're talking about concussion now, and it's a big thing. Well, let's go, okay, let's go right back. Is ripper rugby helping? That would be my question. Is that setting them up? Why don't we get them set up with wrestling one on one, pick some on your own size, and just do some drills to get them confident? Because that, to me, would be a big part. 
I think probably the the thing that's pausing that is when you go to a wrestling coach or you go to a complex with the mats and everything, that person is extremely confident in what they're coaching and the messaging that they're giving to people. So I guess you're right if there's someone who does put a program together, rugby focused, um, all the things you need, I, yeah, can see huge value because like yourself, so many clubs and successful clubs are seeing it as the golden ticket to get huge improvement. Hmm. Um, oh, I did want to ask about breathing. What is the what are you coaching at the moment with the boys breathing um, coming into a scrum? Yeah, so we've, I've played around a little bit with that around breathing out on the bind, uh, breathing in on the bind, and then out on the set. Just let all your power like they do it when they're squatting. So we've done a little bit with that, um, a little bit with timing on the call. Um, once they hit. You know, they, they don't want to be holding their breath as such. Um, mm. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything specific that I do in our scrum program around that, but I have done some training drills with it, which has been quite good. It's becoming quite a big thing now, isn't it, in the old mental health side of it, breathing mm. and, um, you know, um, deep breaths, cold bout, baths, all that sort of thing is, you know, the Wim Hof. So there could be something in there if you looked a little bit deeper. Let's change into something else. You recently coached the the Junior Crusaders side. I'd imagine you really enjoyed that. And from what I saw from Crusaders social media, and geez, they're doing such a great job of what you guys put out. Um, it was a it wasn't just about a game of rugby. It was so much more than that. So could you touch on a little bit more on what you guys got through with the boys and their their families? Yeah. So we um we wanted to make the camp um really unique for what it was because a lot of the guys, well, all of the guys that made New Zealand schools, for example, they had that taken from them because of COVID, there was no competition. And then we had sort of a shortened competition with first 15 rugby. And what we wanted to do is get everyone together on the same page, basically 60 guys come in on a Monday for three-day camp, and then we picked 26 to play one game. So it was brutal. So we had it um, yeah. come up with a video um, that I found on the <laughs> surfing through YouTube as you do, looking for ideas now and again. And there's a um, there's a YouTube clip of a thousand bands playing a Foo Fighters song in a paddock uh, playing Learn to Fly. And they're all playing it together. And what I said, so we we played this highlights video first and foremost. We wanted everyone to come in their first 15 um, training T-shirt, sit down, welcome them in, play the highlights video of all of them playing for their school. And then I says, righto, boys, let's feedback. What did we see in the video? So we had a bit of a discussion. And then I said, okay, I want you to all now go and we presented them with their Crusaders T-shirt for the week. And then I played this video, Learning to Fly, um, by the Foo Fighters, and what was the message? Bringing everyone together, or you, you know, you were at different schools. You didn't, you know, because it's the old story. They all come in. It's like, oh, he played. You know, it's a big old standoff. Played against each other for every year, especially at that age. Jesus. Yeah. So then Johnny Liotto, um, who was a defence coach, he came up with some skits and some get it. You know, go and come up with a team song based around this. But everyone split up. So we did that. And basically, long story short, my message was in the next three days, you know, you've all got the chance to learn to fly because we had all these specialist coaches coming in. Um, you know, Sam Whitler was lucky to be here. Owe Franks was here. Um, some injured boys, um, Cullen Grace, Tom Christie, and, 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 a, and a few others, Jack Goodhue, Bryn Hall was around. And I said, you all got a chance to learn to fly, but not everyone can be in the band to play the Hollanders because we've got to pick 26 and that's life. So that was, so just make these best, these first three days, the best three days we could. So that's what we did. And uh, it was pretty special. And then when the, um, when the boys were named the 26, it was, um, there was a lot of tears actually. It was really tough. And it was, I guess it was a happy, sad moment because because we saw so many guys actually really upset, it's like, shit, we've done a really good job in these three days because they just didn't want to go. Um, but they knew right from the start. And, you know, the WhatsApp group stayed together and, 
you know, they wish guys that were in the team were wishing the boys all the best on the sad day for the game against the Highlanders. So that's really big as, as connecting, isn't it, as a team? And if they left there and they said that was one of the best weeks of my life, um, well, we were happy and the feedback we got from parents and uh, was pretty exceptional, really. So it, it was really enjoyable. And we, you know, obviously when the 26 were made, we did something a little bit more special with you know Richie McCall coming down talking to the captain and his his couple of leaders and just asking questions and talked about what it is to be a crusader and a young man and how how fast things can happen going into the professional world. So it was a great camp. I, I really enjoyed it. Hundred percent. The I guess installing crusaders culture in a in a group like that. How did you go about that? Like showing, telling a bit of the story, what we're about. Um, I'm keen to hear more about that. The actual crusaders messaging, and I suppose Richie cut turning up, and those guys that have played had a lot to do with that as well. Yeah, we we showed um, a couple of legacy videos um, on the crusaders and, and the story of where, where we've come from and where we are now and where we want to head to. Um, one thing I've learned about players is, is they don't they don't care what you know until they know how much you care. Yep. So we put a lot of work, and I said to the coaches and everyone, we, we need to go and get to know these boys before we go and coach them. So that was part of the first day. And then we just lay it in, it in around the Crusaders. Like we had every 100-game Crusader up in the big banners around the whole room. You know, we had the new jersey for next year, which no one had seen. And they walked in there, even though it was a Christchurch football club, no no disrespect to that club. I said to the guys, that our social media guys said, I want this to feel like they're walking into the Crusaders. So we set it up and it had a real presence about it and jersey presentations, you know, training standards. We had... Um, a couple of ex boys come in and spoke around, you know, what it, uh, I think it was Cullen Grace or uh, Tom Christie around what it meant to have his first cap, you know, when he's working with the loose forwards. And you got Sam Whitelock talking with the locks around preparation. And Cron Owen Owen sat upstairs with the front rowers for about 45 minutes talking about nutrition and, you know, making good decisions. And um, your body, you know, Razor presented on your body's your biggest asset to the loose forwards, the more you put in, the more you'll get out, you know, treat it like your bank account. You know, what you're putting in will be what you get out of it. You're about to start a business. So that was, so there's a lot that goes in, I guess, um, a lot around mental health, a lot of um, stuff from New Zealand rugby around um, contracting and agents and all that, which have got to be covered off. But yeah. from a crusader's point of view, we, we just wanted to let them know that, you know, the culture here is pretty special for a reason. Um, you know, I've always had a saying that the great teams and the average teams have all got the same things written on the gym walls. Um, yeah. But the, you know, the truly great ones, the ones that are world leading, they live it every day. I love that. And you mentioned a lot there, nutrition, mental health, um, yeah, your body looking after that. I'm interested to hear about the on-field stuff and and the standards you set, I suppose, as the head coach for that for that program, of how the quality of the stuff that you guys presented on field. Yeah, I think just just following on, can we come back to that, Pete? I just want to just follow on around that off field, like we did. As you've just reminded me something, we did a night with the parents, mm. and um, it was quite. Um, eye-opening for them, I think. Like, we said to them, you know, and I did a bit of a presentation, said, look, we know you love your sons, but professional rugby can be really ruthless. Now, we're not going to... We pride ourselves on setting these young men up to succeed. You know, I gave the example of um, you have a bad day at work, you might get wound up, you know, your boss might give you a tune-up. Richie Mwanga has a bad day at work. You know, five and a half million people on Facebook got an opinion about him. Yeah. <laughs> so so you gotta look after them. You gotta look after them and you gotta just make sure that these young men are ready to handle that. And it was just a message for the parents that you know, sitting on the sidelines in the first 15 rugby, that's great. We know you love your sons, we know you care about them, we do too. Reality is professional rugby, you gotta trust the coaches, you gotta trust the people that are coaching them because that's their profession. Yeah. Um 
And yeah, and, and going going on around the, the standards around um, on the grass, that was, um, I wanted to make it as unique as we could around what a Crusader week would look like. Um, but I was really mindful of not overloading the coaches who were all volunteering their time. Um, we had Andy Gibson doing the attack, who'd been involved with a bit of stuff with um, sort of rep teams for a while. Simon Gunner just come out of Kai Boys, you know, he's coached the the Fords and Johnny Leo, as I mentioned, and a guy, Matt McDougall, who was based in uh, Blenheim, who did a great job sort of piecing everyone together, but sort of gave them an outline of what it looked like for us. But again, I said to them, you boys, it's your session. Coach through your personality. You guys own it. I'll just come in if I need to give you a bit of a hand or, you know, guide you along. And one thing that they understood pretty quick when you're coaching at the amateur level, you can go over time. But I was really hard with the trainer. I said, no, no, this is time on feet. So we've got 30 minutes of units. That's it. You know, if you've got five, how long, how long do you need for this presentation? Oh, it's two clips, five minutes. Now I can tell you it's never five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you might get three minutes of questions. So they all understood. And that was a big part of it was growing the coaches as well. Yeah. Um, gold standard learning. Yeah. You didn't hear, hear about that. Yep. So, um, yeah, or five star, I like to call it. I reckon that's when you learn straight away on the grass. Um, iPads, do a skill, go and watch it and fix it. Fix it on the grass. It's one thing Vern Cotter told me um, with with um, first year with Fiji. He said to me, he said, how long do you need for units tomorrow? And this is like um, Monday heading into the All Blacks test week. And I said, oh, 35 minutes. And he said, how do you know? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, it's usually what, you know, I'll get on a Monday. He said, but you're not coaching the Crusaders now. Yeah. What, if you, what if you're done in 15 minutes? And I said, oh, yeah, I could be. <laughs> but he just challenged me to coach with my eyes. Um, and that is actually gold standard learning and gold standard coaching because if you can show a guy a skill, whether or not it's um, working with Scott Barrett on a line-out jump, have a look at that, do a couple of jolt jumps, and the analyst comes over, shows him the picture, what do you see here? He can see it. He knows the answers. I don't actually need to tell him the answers. He'll find it himself. Oh, I'm ticking. I'm going down to go up. I need to be faster. Okay, we'll fix that up, will we? Done. So there's no reviews in the, you know, reviewing it the next morning, the jump. There's always going to be a little few tweaks. I mean, you don't see everything as a coach. The guy on the fence will always see more. But if you've got your iPads and and – and you can have a look at footage straight away after you've done the skill and then fix it. It's just magic. That's what I call the gold standard. And it's there's gold standard sharing as well. You know, I remember in the early days, you get Kieran Reid working with a young Cullen Grace. It's yeah. like, wow, you just sit back and listen. <laughs> um, the best things often are measurable. How do you measure in the environment the five-star learning? Um, how do we measure it? I think it's, yeah, there's a number of things. I think it depends on player ability as such. And, and I don't, I don't think you can, one thing I've got to be mindful, I talk about my own area is I've got guys in the Ford pack that have played a hundred test matches. You know, Sam Wylock's played in a, played in a few world cups and he's going all right. <laughs> and then I've got young locks like a Mitch Dunshay, Quinn Strange. They want to get to that level. But Sam needs to understand that to bring them up, he needs to share, I need to share. But Quinn and um, Mitch Dunshay, for example, they need to watch, listen, ask so they can grow. Yep. So it's like a revolving learning circle as such. Does that answer your question there? Yeah, I suppose it's a it's a gut feel. And you mentioned about the analysts helping out and being on top of the iPads and solving the problem straight away. I guess whether it was, yeah, it's probably just a feeling within the group 
Um, but you've explained it really well. Absolutely. Yeah, try and work on confirmation learning where you um, you try and catch them. The sort of four four processes I try and stick to. At the start of the meeting, you might have a wee skip with someone or a bit of an icebreaker, hmm. and then then, then you got to you know got to you got to show them. So that's catch them, and then you got to show them whether or not it's in the footage, the whiteboard, putting the blocks out. Then you go and teach them out on the grass and they're helping each other, and then I test them. So at the end of the session, I always finish with a question, and what have we what have we learned today? And, you know, what's two things that you'll use in your role and yeah. making it as, as simple as we can for the boys, and that, that all comes to do with the language and the questions you're asking. I, I want to ask you about the coaching makeup of your group. Obviously, Ray's is a, a huge personality, but it seems like you guys work extremely well together as – how do you keep that going throughout a season, making sure that everyone's accountable and happy and and probably contributing as well? Yeah, I think, um, I guess, if we, you talk about, you know, honesty, I think um, the coach's room and, and the Crusaders' side of it, if you didn't know the score of a game uh, over the weekend and you entered the environment on a Monday and watched a review, you wouldn't know if we won or lost because we're really honest and we're like that with the, with the, with the coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about Razor. I mean, him and I work together coming up 10 years now. Um, we're both very different, um, but we're both really honest with each other. Um, and I know that I can mention some stuff to Ray that he might not have caught on his blind spot, but I'll do it at the right time. I think that's quite important as assistant. You'd never... You know, try and challenge something in a in a coach's meet in a coach's meeting or a management meeting, and you know, you, I think you got to do that a little bit more skillfully with the boss. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, there's nothing to prove there, really. It's like, well, look, you know, I'd rather do it. You know, have you thought about this? I'm not sure we sort of got that quite right. I'm just just have a think about this. So I think that's a lot with how we work. Is there something that us uh, watching from the outside, obviously seeing? Uh, raises personality that we maybe don't understand about him as a as a coach or something that gets misconceived often about him uh, I think I think Razor is he's he, he's very unique I'm not sure there's anyone in the world like him <laughs> and he he but he is what he is and he's not trying to be someone else that's what I've always loved about Ray he's got an unbelievable um, unique and skilled um, it's a prized skill set of being able to get everyone to play for him and yet a lot of people will probably see the ray and the you know the fun and the surf and the jokes but he can square up a room like you know and it's not yelling or anything like that he's just his language and his mindset around what we should be doing and where we should be heading and to ask a question boys you know, is a standard good enough at the moment? And just leave that there. You know, the power of the pause. He's really good at that. And he's an, he's a lateral thinker of the game. Like, he's always chucking up a map on the whiteboard or coming up with something absolutely random. Some, morning, some mornings you don't even know where he's heading, but it's like, yeah, no, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you guys connect? How often are you guys talking to each other and making sure you're all on the same page? Do you guys do extra stuff outside the, the office just to make sure that group's humming? Yeah, we do. We always... Sorry, keep- I wanted to ask as well, and then you can touch on this, that experience with um, Team New Zealand on the on the boat, that looked pretty amazing experience as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think um, with the coaches, we're always meeting. We, we get on really good. We're all different. You know, um, great thing. Like, Tamadi Allison came in this year. Uh, unbelievable times. Just such a great uh, manner and how he presents. Um, really passionate about what he does the boys respected him and you know to have him back is outstanding Andrew Goodman good he's been there for a while now and he's you know he just loves it he works so hard goody and loves you know he's doing well with Tasman obviously but he puts a lot of work into his backs and, and getting them getting them aligned and you know we have some honest selection meetings I can I can tell you that you know we all care about our own areas and and Scotty yeah. Hanson's so passionate and you know, works unbelievably hard at our attack and trying to evolve that. And 
you know, he's he's been around the world now and done a lot of work with Japan and he's extremely thirsty to be better every day, old Scotty, and he's he'll challenge all of us. It's, it's great. So I think I think this is the first time and probably uh, since 2018 that we've had the same coaching group uh, for two years in a row. So we're pretty excited about that um, cohesion and, and, and those connections. In the uh, experience on the boat? Yeah, Team New Zealand, that, that was uh, that was really exciting. Uh, we enjoyed that. It was great to connect up with Pete Burling and and Blair Chook. It was, um, you know, they, they obviously, how they operate is pretty sen- sensational. A lot of what we wanted to do there was um, communication under pressure. So to go out in the boat and, and listen to them talking and the communication they were using and just having the same tone through the mic and not getting... Um, too over aroused if something wasn't right and that sort of thing was was really good and stay in touch with both of them and build a pretty good relationship and friendship you know like we went up and saw Grant Dalton and he said that you know these boys Blair Took and and Pete Burling that they're the they're the McCaw and Carter of, of the of the of the yachting world they're, they're unbelievable so we presented to them on on who we were and, and a little bit of theming stuff which they enjoyed and um, yeah got on the grinder but you know the arms are not quite long enough but <laughs> well, they're on they're on bikes nowadays aren't they they're on bikes yeah yeah, yeah. No, what, but, what bike um, test. can you talk more about that i've heard about that as well the straight talk that uh, i think they may have, have called it a few years back just actually on the boat the tonage because I, I find that really fascinating especially on a rugby field especially in front of a packed house and imagine that could be powerful for a group yeah, like um, you know, it's 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 messaging. Like, how many messages get get down to the players, and and what's actually important, and the time the message gets down, does the message become the problem? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, hang on, that's actually gone. We, we've got to be a step ahead, and they're always a step ahead because they're looking for wind. Yeah. They're never happy with where they are because the wind could, they've got to know, right, what's happening next. So that's what we got out of that. And you listen to them even on the TV. They're never raising their voice. They're just communicating the facts. And we come off that boat and mm-hmm. Pete said, look, there was probably a little bit of noise today that we didn't need. And he gave a couple of examples. And, um, you know, do we really need that? They come off straight off and they sit on the wharf, stand on the wharf there and they have a, what they call a capture meeting. Right, what could we have done better? Just instant feedback. Gold standard learning right there, you know. How could that day have been better? And I suppose that would have been awesome for you guys giving messages on the mic about is this finding wind, I suppose, as they call it, or is this just a problem that's already in the rear view mirror? Yeah, it's got a classic example that be would be a, a, a decision at the breakdown. We can look back at that on the footage, but that's all we're doing. We're going backwards. It's like, well, what's going to happen on the next one? <laughs> yeah. Because it's gone. So that's what we got out of that. And, um, it, you know, it was really enjoyable. That, um, it was good. Um, it was a good day. Pretty privileged to go out with them. And, again, they talked, you know, we talked around building a season. Whereas they said, well, we haven't got one. We're going straight into a World Cup final. Yeah. As long as, you know, <laughs> the first time they race is the America's Cup. I was like, oh, wow. So, <laughs> you know, and I want to ask one more question on that: the the shed and their setup, impressive. Unbelievable! Oh, <laughs> mate, you get behind that black curtain, but you know, and you just have a look in there, and it's like, wow, this is next level. I think there's a hundred people work there, and you know, full disclosures and that that we had to sign on the way in, and but unbelievably wow. welcoming, and the computer side of it, the communication, the drawings, the you know, the the data. Oh, all the analysis that goes in and and here they are their opposition um, I think it was American Magic would have, uh, straight across from them mm. and um, I said to Pete I said because we've been out in the boat and he said I, I said oh who are these guys he said oh that's all the opposition coming out to watch us sail it's all the other chase boats and I said, and I said imagine just opening the doors and saying to um, the Highlanders I'll just come in and film training yeah, and he yeah. said, well, mate, you've got to be a step ahead. Like, they're still going to beat you. 
And I was like, man, that's some mindset. Yes. <laughs> wow, that's powerful. I, I think I remember you posted a picture and I remember thinking, shit, that would have been a, a great experience. One of the best presentations I've had as a player, someone came and spoke to us about the time they capsized and they had to recover for the next day race. It was just an incredible story. Um but anyway, let, let, let's carry on. I want to I want to talk to you about your COVID nineteen experience, if we can. Um, I know that it was a, a major for you, and I suppose hopefully we're coming to the end of it as as countries. Um, but for you, it really maybe helped you learn a life lesson about being really grateful. So keen mm. to hear about that, if you can. Yeah, I'll probably get upset here. It was tough, Pete. Um, it was a year yesterday, actually. Um, yeah, I was isolated um, pretty much by myself for 60 nights. Um, it was pretty pretty tough. Um, learned a lot about myself. Um, went to hospital over in France, the other side of the world, and um, the wife, Kath, she was... She, she nearly booked her ticket um, to come and see me, you know, because we didn't know where it was heading. Um, but I've done a lot of work. Um, I've done a lot of work mentally. Um, last season, in all honesty, was a little bit of a blur for me uh, mentally, but I've got through that, done a lot of work with Kerry Evans, done a lot of work with Guy Rico but Gomez here in Christchurch, and I'm um, I'm on fire now. Um, I'm, I'm unbelievable, and even though I probably got a bit emotional there, it's just... There's still that um, circuit breaker or that wee trigger in me that reminds me of what it, what it was like because I honestly did not think I was going to get home and I did not think I was going to survive it. Um, it affects everyone differently. And for all anti-vaxxers that might be listening, <laughs> well, if you're not going to get the jab, don't rely on the health system to get you right if you get COVID and get really sick. Jesus. Because um, it knocked me for six. And... Um, really tough, you know, like we went through different stages when I initially found out I had it and, you know, we had a couple of players got it that had come from French clubs and then no one had it the next day and then we retested and we'd already training, trained and then 28 of us had it. Um, myself and Richie Gray were the worst. We were the ones that both went to hospital. Um, and, yeah, if you can imagine going for a run uh, and then coming home, laying on your back and getting someone to stand on your chest and try and breathe that's what I felt like sure. I just thought my, I just thought my body was shutting down um so it was hard it was hard on the family being so far away from home and you know the FaceTimes were some pretty tough dark phone calls I think hanging up was the hardest um but I got through it and um I feel better for it and I've learned a lot everything they say around the COVID fog and the not knowing where you're at or where you're heading and you know a little bit of memory blank it's it's all true and, and it affects everybody diff differently uh, but yeah i got through it mate so, so there you go in the in the darkness of those 60 days like what was going through the head um i was really lucky actually i had um well, well i wasn't lucky <laughs> I, I i was just um I was just trying to, there's a couple of key people actually that really, really helped me get through it. One was, one was my wife because she knew how bad I was. Um, Luke Whitelock, and he probably doesn't even know this, but um, he, um, he was in France and he was just touching base every two or three days, just a message and had the odd calls. He might, how's it even going? And even though I was, Saying yeah, I'll be all right. <laughs> Knowing I was shit. Just those couple of messages he sent me were pretty good. Um, he sort of got me through it. Another mate, an Aussie, Steve Hemi, who's a good friend. He he was reaching out as well as mum and dad. So so they got me through it. But the mindset uh, wasn't too good because you just you just don't know. It's a foreign country. I was in my room. Mm. Um, you know, Richie Gray. We went to hospital together. Him and I, him, me and Rich. So we went we went through a lot together. In that whole time, really, and um, yeah, didn't know if I was going to get out um, because I still had it, and we were ready to go home. So I still had COVID in that um, 
uh, Fiji Georgia game that was at Murrayfield, and my flight home was the next morning because I'd actually buggered up my MIQ spot. So, <laughs> and I, if I had to cancel it, I wouldn't have got home till after Christmas. So I had to leave the day um, after the game. And I still had COVID. And by that time, it didn't matter if you're coming to the country, if you had COVID as such. Wow. And all I wanted was a um, positive te- uh, negative test. I, like, I just wanted that. And got to the counter, the Emirates counter in Heathrow, and, and the guy said, um, have you been around anyone who's had COVID? <laughs> have you been around? And I said, yes, I have. He said, okay, and he never asked me if I'd had it. Right. But I know that if he had of, I wouldn't have got on that plane. And I'm sitting in the uh, lounge at Heathrow Airport and I've got my result, negative test. Oh, <laughs> and hell. then flew home and arrived in Auckland, had to do two weeks, more weeks of ISO, but that was actually the easy part because I knew I was home. Yeah. And I do just want to, last one on this, just gratitude. I know that it's a, bi- a big one. And I think through, obviously, you've had a, a, an amazing experience um, with this. But everyone else has gone through a tough time as well. Um, and it's really hard to be probably grateful at the moment. But how's that changed your outlook? Oh, amazingly. Yeah, 100%. Like, um, grateful for, for life. Like, honestly, as I said, it was a year ago yesterday since I got my test, and oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't. I was honestly I didn't think I was going to survive. I honestly didn't. So you appreciate every day, and mm. you got to embrace it because um, you just don't know what's around the corner. Yeah, good shit. Um, thanks for sharing that. Awesome. We're gonna um, smack it out. With some more meaty stuff. Just talking about malls, and then we'll, we'll wrap it there. Um, so the setup within the Crusaders, I remember speaking with Razor about he was so proud of the defensive mall. Can you talk about in one of the stats and how many games it had gone through without um, another team scoring a try um, against you boys? So how's who coaches what? How's that set up between yourself and him and um, and that set up? Yes, I do the mall. I do all the mall defence. Yeah, yeah, that's my baby. The mall defence and the mall attack. And we, we take a lot of pride in that. And we have, um, we do really well at it. We have got a pretty good stat there, but I'll, I'll keep that humble for now. Okay, love it. <laughs> um, yeah, we do a lot of work um, around our mall D and having real pride in our line and making sure we do our homework of how to stop other teams' malls. And our mall attack is something that the boys all buy into. Um, yeah, there's some good stuff we do that we have a bit of a uh, change up for it. It's we you know we've called it rafting. Yeah. We've used the water analogy of being in a current. Um, if you can't see, you can't breathe, or you can't hear, you're usually in the right spot <laughs> <laughs> in a mall. Love that. Yeah, I've been yeah. in many myself. No, you wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you got to set them up. I think it's been a real point of difference for us over the last few years. But we've got to evolve that. You know, raises is, um, is really challenging me hard on that now. How we can go to the next level, and um, I guess it's similar to the rowing boat analogy. You need everyone heading in the right direction, but more often than not, that doesn't happen because um, someone's come round from the opposition or. You haven't been able to attack where you, you thought the weak spot was going to be, but done a lot of work looking at South Africa and how they maul because they are world leaders. Like they ain't just the best in the world or world class at mauling. That they are consistently leading. Um, yep, they have got big men and uh, um, bigger athletes, but again, the scrummaging analogy—you just got to know how to use your body. Um, first as an individual and they do that really really well how they build the corner of their mall and so forth so I've done a lot of work looking at them and um I'd love I'm to sure. coach, I'd love to coach against them though yeah tell you. <laughs> so I'm sure with super rugby when it was a little bit more normal and playing South African teams you would have had conversations with coaching and and gone hard in a chat like that after a game is that what guys like yourself do with the coaches yeah Opposition coaches, yeah. Oh yeah, mate. I I love that. Like all, 
get on good with all the coaches. I love going to have a catch up with Dooms, you know, catch up with Rangi at the Blues and just, you know, even during the year and, you know, we're always going at it, you know, against each other. But, you know, you, I think it was Wayne Smith said, the coach that doesn't share doesn't grow. Yeah. You've know, you, you got to share, you know, because you've got to be doing something different next week anyway. So, you know, we're all trying to win, but I think New Zealand especially, it's 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 all too small um, for for any dickheads, you know, to not want to go and catch up and have a beer with the opposition yeah. coach after after the game, you know. I think it's I think it's an important part and I think it says a lot about your people skills and your manner. Um, if you can do that and just go and have a yarn, you know, I always like to go and have a chat to the opposition front row boys and sometimes yeah. have a yarn to the ref and you sort Monday out when that comes. Can you talk about the first two seconds of them all and why it's so important to win that part and what are some of the key things to win the first two seconds of them all attacking or defensively? It is. You win that, you win them all. It's like the punch of a scrum. Crouch point set, hit over the mark, you're away. You're there on the back foot. There's no recovery time. The Brumbies are outstanding at it. Yeah. It's all about getting forward, getting your head in the right spot, and going as hard as you can using your body. Again, your power comes from your ground. If you've got maximum power from your feet, you're going to be going pretty good. Using the rafting analogy, what would we see someone who's not on the raft doing? Swimming or trying to get into the raft from the opposition? Yeah. Potentially. Um Maybe getting a little bit long in, in the raft. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, the boys have probably often said, oh, you can't tell anyone about the raft or the mauling. But <laughs> was it who was it? Jose Mourinho, I think. I saw a video clip on him once. He said, you can have all my drills, come down and film them all, copy them yeah. all, do whatever you want. The only difference is I'm not coaching them. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I like that. Hundred <laughs> like percent. And the, ta- the tactic good. change. The tactic changes every week. Opposition. Where you're going to do them? What alignment option you're going to do it off? So, yeah, I, I, t- I totally agree with that. Yeah, you just you just got to be trying to get better. Um, it's not like you, you know, you send. It's not like you. I'm giving everyone all our lineout calls, <laughs> but they change every week anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the last one on morning, I want to just touch on is the Monday morning mall sessions and I suppose more of the mentality behind why you find them important, um, why they need to be done at a certain intensity um, and probably something all coaches can learn from that about why you do it. Well, I think um, I think it's really important to understand the difference between a player and a coach on a Monday morning. So a coach comes in and you're on fire. <laughs> you've, watched all, you've watched all the footage, you've got all the reviews done, you've watched the game, you've analysed the boys, you've got all their footage for the one-on-ones, here's the review, you've got all this information, the players come in, they're buggered. <laughs> they're shattered. So that they, they build their week up with their energy. We, we, we actually drop off. Now, we say less at the end of the week, but the sweet spot is... Just giving them enough in the reviews or the previews, just a couple of key things. I just need you to remember a couple of things. No different to your training session, Pete. Write down your training plan. You know, I want to get through this, 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 and this. Then get your highlighter out and go, right, these two here are non-negotiable. I've got to cover these. The rest of them is just a bonus. We, we don't do any um, live mauling on Monday. We might just do what we call the people in the right places. Drill, just find your find where you got to be. Tuesday we might do it with a little bit more um, intensity, with a little bit of opposition putting some pressure on, defending how they will. Thursday we'll go at it. Yeah. So it sort of builds, you know. Um, it, that's that's how we'd sort of would sort of shape it. Outstanding, mate. I'm really happy with that. Got through everything I want to cover, and so much of yeah, what you do there has been really successful. So thanks so much for for sharing. Is there anything you wanted to to wrap up on? Oh no, thanks for the opportunity, Pete. Um, been following your 
podcasting that for a while. It's it's great that you get some um, good people on. It's a privilege to be asked. I think if there's any coach out there listening, just just um, coach through your own personality, be yourself, and 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 back yourself. Awesome, mate. Great way to finish up. Thanks, mate. No worries, Pete. And when you finish with that, I suppose you're gonna fly, huh? Come on and slam!